basket. If you guys would start passing it around, that's for your section. And so if you would do that. But also there is a, an attendance chart. And I'm really enjoying this attendance chart because it doesn't tell me who's here. It really tells me who's not here. And every uh, week I get a list of people that haven't been here in three weeks and I get to call them and check on them. And I wouldn't be able to do that without this happening. And so that's very meaningful to me. I hope it's meaningful to the people I'm calling. And so if you would put your name on that uh, as it goes by. You know, it might be helpful. I know some of it's already back. We are really in need of updating our phone numbers. Because sometimes I call and it's the wrong number. Uh, you know, I'm calling Helen and I get Harold. And Harold doesn't belong to Helen. And so it would be helpful if you would maybe update your phone number on there so that we could know how to communicate with you uh, by phone. Really uh, was surprised this morning by my sons Jeremiah and William singing that particular song. I didn't know that was going to happen. That was really uh, uh, significant to me. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that song, uh, that song was... Uh, their mother's, perhaps their mother's favorite song, and uh, Debbie passed away in 2007. And in the tribute that we did for her at her memorial service uh, on the video, that was the last song that was played uh, as she uh, would leave uh, her, uh, as she was doing Mrs. PJ, that would be the, one of the last songs that she would sing at times. And so, boy, that was, that was really, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I, 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 you probably didn't. And uh, what's really important about that for my boys is that they did that of their own volition. Because they have conversations all the time. Do you remember when we got forced to sing in front of the church by, well, this was of their own volition, and that really means a lot to me. And, I know their, their mother would be really honored by that. We're in a series of messages that uh, this is really not your typical Mother's Day message, but uh, I believe the Lord will use it to bless all of us this morning, including uh, those of you that are moms. Uh, we're, we're in a series of messages, and we're, we're considering the, the question, what if the Apostle Paul was alive today? And he wrote a letter to the church of Oklahoma City. What would he say? Or if he wrote a, church, a letter to the church at Western Hills, what would he say? Or, you know, there were times where Paul wrote personal letters to individuals. At least four of them, of the 13 that he wrote, were just written to individuals. If he wrote a personal letter to you, the Apostle Paul, you know, what would he say? And so we've been... Uh, looking at this for the last several weeks and, and we haven't got out of the greeting yet. You know, we're still in the greeting and hopefully this morning we're going to finish the greeting. And so I've called this message The Greeting Continued by the Apostle Paul if he was writing a letter to the church here in Oklahoma City. In all 13 of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament, Part of his greeting was a blessing. <clears throat> and that's very significant. That as he greeted those that were going to read his letters that he was sending to various individuals and various churches, he would include in that greeting a blessing. And in 10 of the 13 letters that he wrote, the blessing is almost identical. And here's what he said as he wrote letters to the churches. He said, grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you one example where he did this. It was in a letter that he wrote to uh, a church that was in the city of Corinth. So in your Bible, it's called 1 Corinthians. And in that letter, this is what he said. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you, 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In both letters that he wrote to a fellow named Timothy, which Timothy was a young man that the Apostle Paul had mentored, that he had discipled. And then in a letter to Titus, who Paul also mentored, Paul added mercy to his blessing. Look what he said to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I think I could say pretty confidently that if the Apostle Paul was writing a letter to the church at Oklahoma City, that he would end his letter with a blessing. And perhaps it would sound something like this. This is, this is Oklahoma City chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God to the church of Oklahoma City, to those who are beloved of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, anytime someone repeats themselves that frequently, one of the things that it tells us is that that greeting was very significant to Paul. Now, Paul wasn't just being nice by giving a blessing. I'm sure that he was being nice. It's always great when you greet someone to extend to them a blessing. Sometimes we do that by extending our hand to them and we shake their hand. Sometimes we may give them a hug. In the New Testament, they would greet each other with what they called a holy kiss up on the forehead. But it was a way of greeting someone when you, when you, when you met them. And so certainly Paul was being kind when he gave this blessing in all 13 of his letters by, uh, by issuing this blessing, he was being so kind. But we also know that Paul was very intentional about everything that he said. Paul was very calculated in everything that he said. And what's most important that we know about Paul is that Paul was inspired by the Spirit of God in everything that he said. And so when he wrote these words, he wasn't just being kind. He was communicating a message that he felt like every church and every person that he wrote to needed to hear. And I'm, that what, you know what that means for me? You need to hear it. And what that means for me is that I need to hear it. And so here's the blessing again. He said, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as we look at this and we consider why was it so important to the Apostle Paul, and we consider what, what difference did it make? What if he omitted it from the letter? What difference would it make in the lives of the disciples that received it? And as we consider, is this blessing right now meaningful to you? Here I am telling you what this blessing is, and I'm telling you that if the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church today, he would include this, this blessing, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Is that even meaningful to you? Well, let me ask you this, do you ever use it? <laughs> When's the last time that you went up to someone and said, by the way, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? I would have to say, you know, I don't use that one very often. You know, I don't use that language very often. Maybe I would if I understood more about what Paul was saying. And so I want us to dive into this for a few minutes this morning and really try to understand this blessing. Why did Paul do it? Why is it meaningful to us? Why should it be meaningful to us if Paul was writing a letter to us. One of the things that I want you to understand in order to understand the blessing is that in his letters, Paul used these words grace and peace to communicate or describe both a position and a condition. One more time. In these two words, when he used them, grace and peace, and he used them frequently, Paul was, was describing both 
a condition and a position. He used the word peace, for example, to describe the disciples' position with God through Jesus Christ. For example, when he wrote the letter to Romans in Romans 5.1, he said, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's he communicating there? Well, what he's communicating there is that he's communicating a position. The word peace that he used there in that particular verse comes from a Greek word that means to be joined to someone. Rather than being separated from someone, the word peace means to be joined to them. And these disciples that he was writing to, they were at peace with God. They had joined, been joined to God through Jesus Christ. There was no longer any enmity between God and these disciples. They were no longer the enemies of God. They were no longer the objects of God's wrath through Jesus Christ. They were at peace with God. You know, when you think of the word peace, if I asked you what's the opposite of peace, you would say what? Trouble? What else would you say? What? Chaos. What else would you say? See, what you're describing as you look at that is a condition. Trouble and chaos. Paul is talking about a position that we're in. We're at peace with God. In other words, we're no longer at war with God. And we're at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul did also use the word peace to describe the disciples' condition. For example, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, it's not, it's not peace with God, it's the peace of God. He's talking about here, he's talking about a condition of your soul. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So they were at peace with God, but when he wrote this blessing to the churches, he wasn't telling them they still needed peace with God. He was blessing them with the peace of God. He wanted them to have the peace of God in their soul no matter what their circumstances were. You know, I can't think of a better thing to wish for people. As I consider as a pastor the troubles that you are going through in your life, I want you to be blessed with peace in spite of your troubles. I want you to know not only peace with God, you've got that in Jesus Christ. That's your position in Christ. You don't have to worry about that because Jesus Christ has secured that position for you. But what you really need is the peace of God. And as Paul was writing these letters to the churches, all of the churches were encountering all kinds of trials and difficulties. Some of them are very similar to what we're going through as a church. We have people that are experiencing chronic illness, and they deal with the chronic illness every day. That could rob you of your peace. We have people that, are, that have within their family people that are terminally ill. I want you to know that could really deal, that would really affect your peace in your soul. We have people that are going through relationship crisis right now, people that are going through divorce, people that are going through problems with their children. I want you to know those trials are common to man, and they were experiencing them back then. But in addition to that, they were experiencing incredible the trial of persecution. I mean, their lives were in danger place yet in our nation but they were in danger and what they needed was the peace of God in their soul they had peace with God through Jesus but they needed the peace of God so Paul was blessing them with the peace of God in their soul but Paul also blessed them with the grace of God <clears throat> he used the word Grace, 
uh, in the same way that he used peace. Uh, for example, in Romans six fourteen, Paul said, "For sin shall not have dominion of." Over you, for you're not under law, but you're under what? Grace. Now, how is he using the word grace there? Is he using the word grace as your position or your condition? He's using it as your position. You're under. You're under grace. He's talking about your position in Christ. In the New Testament, the word grace is the word charis. C-H-A-R-I-S is the transliteration of the Greek word. And what that word means, it means to lean towards someone to extend favor or blessings to them. That's what the word grace means. Literally means to lean towards someone in order to extend favor or blessings to them. And in his letters, Paul was saying, he said, the disciples, you disciples, you're under grace. You're in a position where you're under grace. They were in a position with God through Jesus Christ in which God was always, 24-7, leaning toward them to extend them his favor. Wow. So they were under grace. Their position in Christ was secure. They did not have to perform for God to be in this position of being under grace. Grace. You see, under the old covenant, under the law covenant, the Jews had to maintain God's favor by keeping his laws. And if they did not keep his laws, they were at odds with God again. And they would lose his favor. But to be under grace means in the new covenant that God, through Jesus Christ, is always leaning toward us extending to us his blessing and his favor. Well, that's a great, great position to be in with God and to know that, that you don't have to worry about whether or not you're under God's grace or whether you're under his wrath. But Paul also used the word not only to describe the word grace to describe our position, he used the word also to describe their condition. Now listen to this. This is just one example. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. You see, he's not talking there about their position. I mean, the apostles were under grace. And that wasn't ever going to change. No, he's talking about the condition they were experiencing. They were experiencing, it says, great grace was upon them all. Now, here's what happened. And this is what happens when, when God's grace, as far as your condition, is upon you. Here's, here's what happens to you. It changes you. <laughs> it changes you. And here's how it changed them. Look at it. It says, And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses, they sold them. That's incredible how they were loving one another in the church of Jesus Christ there in Jerusalem. And, and they sold them and they brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and they laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as everyone had need. Let me tell you something. You may be under grace as a disciple of Jesus. You are under grace. But you know what? When the grace of God is upon you, it changes you. It causes you. It motivates you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Like go and sell all your land and take the proceeds and give it to those who were in need. That is the grace of God. So the grace of God is not only a position, it is a condition, it is a motivation. And how many of you would say this morning, you know what, as a disciple of Jesus, I need more grace? Yeah? If you understand what grace really is, 
you would raise your hand. In fact, you'd go, God, give me more grace. I want to be like these early disciples. I want to be so impacted by this motivation, not a position. I want to be so motivated by this, this, this condition called grace that we would love one another the way they loved one another in the early church. So the disciples were under grace, but in his letters, Paul used the word grace not only to describe a position, but to describe a motivation that the disciples needed in their souls in order to fulfill the purpose that God had for their lives. And you know what? You can't increase your position in Christ. You either have it or you don't. You're either with him or you're against him. But I want you to understand your motivation. <laughs> oh, boy, my motivation, it can go up and it can go down, right? My experience of that motivation can change. And I need every day, and you need every day, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you need more grace in your life. The Apostle Peter said it this way in 2 Peter 3, 17, 18. He said, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But what? Grow. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I first came to Jesus Christ, I really thought I was motivated. But there was a lot to learn about Jesus that I didn't know. And there was a lot to learn about his word that I didn't know. And so as I gained a knowledge of Jesus Christ, I would have these moments where I knew I needed more grace. I needed a greater motivation than what I had even at the beginning of my salvation in order to follow through on what I was learning about Jesus and the way he wanted me to live. For example, I got married. I didn't have a clue about how Jesus wanted me to relate to my wife. And so I didn't relate to her very well when we first got married. In fact, I was terrible. I was terrible. It's amazing that she stuck with me because I was such a, a terrible husband. But I got into the Word of God and through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I began to realize, ooh, <laughs> I need to make some changes here, you know? I mean, I ran into some verses that were incredible verses like husbands love your wives like Christ loves the church. Now, I had a little bit of understanding of how Christ loved the church. He totally laid down his life as a sacrifice for people. And now I'm seeing in the word of God that he's telling me, I need to love my wife that way. I need to love her the way Jesus loves me. Oh, my goodness. You know what I needed? I needed more grace. I needed greater motivation. And so I began to cry out to God, God, please. I mean, that looks impossible to me. To love my wife like you love me, like you love the church, how can I do that? Lord, would you give me greater grace, greater motivation in order to fulfill your purpose in my life? And you'd have to ask my wife, Sandra, currently, if you know, God has changed me or not. Because I think she's the benefactor of all that early work that went on in those early years. And then the whole thing about having children. When I began to gain a knowledge of Jesus Christ and his word about parenting, I, I didn't know what that looked like. I had to learn from Jesus and his word. What did that look like to parent a child, to be a good father to a child? And I don't know, maybe my children would tell you I've never learned that. I don't know, you'd have to ask them that. But I, want, I realized when I learned that, oh, there's got to be some changes here in the way that I relate. So Lord, 
teach me. But it wasn't just teach me. It was, Lord, I need more grace. I need greater motivation to follow through. This is not easy here. And your word says that if we yoke ourselves to you, that your burden is easy and your yoke is light. Lord, I don't feel that right now. This is difficult. And then what, what the Lord wants us to do is turn to him. He wants us to humble our soul before him and receive grace to do what he told us to do. You know, we didn't know what to do as far as parenting. And uh, we started looking for resources. And, and one of the resources that we came across was a resource written by James Dobson called Dare to Discipline. You know how that, how I got motivated there was really not through grace, perhaps, but God uses all kinds of things to give us his grace. But we went to a, a restaurant uh, to eat when Josh was about a, a year old. And that boy, he, he cried and threw a fit the whole time we were in the restaurant. Now, what made that significant? It was one of those restaurants where you run the flag up. You know, when your plate's empty and they bring, you know, you get more food and you run it down. And you can run it up and down as much as, as you want. Well, how many times a year do you think we ever went to a restaurant like that back then? Very rarely. And so I was, I have to admit, I was sort of selfishly motivated. But when we left the restaurant that day, I said to Debbie, I said, look, that's never going to happen again. We've got to make some changes as parents here. Because not only was that disturbing our peace, but he was disturbing the whole restaurant. And I said, if we're ever going to be able to go to a restaurant with our young children again and enjoy the meal, we have got to learn something from God's word about how to train these children. And so we started looking at God's word and we started reading God's word. And neither one of us knew a whole lot about what God said about training children. Boy, as we learned it, it was like, oh my goodness. This is hard, being a parent. This is, this is tough, being a parent. When we, when we gained a knowledge of Jesus and his word and, and the way he wanted us, what he wanted us to be like, and he wanted, he, he wanted us to be things like loving to them all the time. And he wanted us to be things like patient with them all of the time, you know? And he wanted us to, to, be, to consider them to be a blessing of all things, these children. To be a blessing instead of to be a nuisance. And, and he, there was so much that we discovered in his word. Hey, you know what we needed? We needed grace. We needed grace. And so we would humble our souls before the Lord. And the boys could tell you stories. More about their mother than about me, her humbling her soul in the bathroom. You know? Because that's where she went when she needed grace. And when she was struggling with her emotions and her feelings, she would go in there. And what would she do? She'd humble her soul. And she wanted to receive grace from God. So grace was a motivation. And God wants us to grow in grace. He doesn't want us just to be satisfied with the grace that we receive when we receive Jesus. And now, okay, all my sins are forgiven. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's awesome. I'm satisfied. No, he wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as we look at this blessing and uh, we consider it, this blessing of grace and peace was both an affirmation of the disciples' position with God. It's important to know where you stand with God. That you're not always doubting, where do I stand with God? Is he for me or is he against me? I want you to know, if you're in Jesus Christ, he is for you. Period. Okay? It's done. Through Jesus Christ. You don't have to perform for God to be for you. He is for you. Okay? But you know what? This is not only an affirmation that he's making in this blessing. This is an appeal to God for the condition of their soul. He wanted them to experience peace and grace in their soul. What a deal. Great way to, to bless people. Say, hey, Michael, grace and peace to you.
from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Sandra, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Britt, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You got it? That raises some questions. One of them is, are you under the grace of God? <clears throat> you see, the Bible teaches that there's only one way to be under the grace of God. The word grace means to have God's unmerited favor. To be under grace means to be in a position of favor. And let me tell you something. There's only one way to be in that position of favor. And that's through God's son, Jesus. In other words, in order to be in favor with God the Father, you've got to be in right relationship with Jesus the Son. And the way you enter into that relationship is by repenting of your sins and believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And at that moment, when you receive Jesus, your position changes. You go from being an enemy of God to being a friend of God. You go from, from being at enmity with God to being God's friend. And you go from being absolutely away from God to being joined with God and united with God and beginning a relationship with God. Oh, I'm telling you, there's no amount of money that you can pay for that. To be under the grace of God. Another question it raises is if you're under the grace of God, are you experiencing the grace of God? What's your motivation? If you've received Jesus, are you growing in grace? Are you getting more motivated, church, the older you get? Are you getting less motivated? If you're getting less motivated, you need to get more grace. The older you get, the more grace you need, right? Right? If you're going to really fulfill God's purpose in your life, boy, you need more grace. And then it raises the question, are you at peace with God? And that's related to the first question. Are you under grace? Are you at war with God? Or are you at peace with God this morning? Through the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way that you can be at peace with God. It's only his death that pay, will pay for your sins and reconcile you to God. And if you're at peace with God, are you experiencing the peace of God as you come in here this morning? I mean, what is the condition of your soul this morning? Well, <clears throat> as I look at the church of Jesus Christ in our city, what I see is a lot of folks that have passed through the baptismal waters and they're not showing any signs that they're really under grace. There's not any real significant change in their life. They continue in the practices that they practiced before they came to Jesus. Rather than being changed by the grace of God. And then, and then as I look at the church of Oklahoma City, we think we've got difficulties. We've got a lot of difficulties, as I said. But I see so many folks that are they're so troubled, and they're not finding the peace of God through Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning, and you're not under grace, and you're not at peace with God, the first thing that you need to do is you need to come to Jesus. You need to receive Jesus. You need to believe upon Jesus and receive Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin so that you can be joined with God and at peace with God and so that you can be under God's grace and you can know that you're the object of God's favor in your life. But if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not experiencing his grace and his peace, What's the problem? What's the problem? I mean, you can be a disciple of Jesus under the grace of God and come to a place where you resist God. You see, I could have said, I had the free will to say, 
when he said, okay, here's the kind of husband I want you to be to your wife, I could have said, no way. I didn't lose my free will. I had to be willing to yield myself to his purpose in order to receive the grace, in order to receive peace in my soul. I had to be willing to do that. And I see so many that are saying, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up for heaven. I signed up for forgiveness of sin. I didn't sign up for loving my wife unconditionally or loving my husband unconditionally. I didn't sign up for being that kind of parent to my child. You know, I want to continue in the, in the lifestyle that I was in before. You know what's missing in the lives of so many that have, that have walked down an aisle and they've responded to the, the call to be saved and, they, and receive the grace of God and be at peace with God. What's missing from so many is that you've got to yield to the purpose once you come to know Jesus. And do you know what that purpose is? I mean, it's the same purpose for all of us. The moment we receive Jesus, God has a purpose for us. And I want you to understand that no matter what you go through in your life, whatever your trial might be, if you receive Jesus, this is his purpose for you. You can count on it. His purpose is to conform you into the likeness of Jesus. In Romans 8, 28, you know the verse, many of you do. All things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. What's the purpose? Well, it's found in verse uh, 29. For whom he foreknew... He also predestined us to be conformed into the image of Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you understand that if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that God the Father's purpose for you is that you would be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ? In uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Apostle Paul said this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, God's purpose for your life is that you would glorify Jesus by being transformed into his image. Well, let me close with this. Why should you accept God's purpose if you are a disciple of Jesus? If you claim to be a believer in Jesus, why, why accept his purpose? Why not just say, you know, God, you know, I appreciate you dying for me, saving me, you know, getting me a place in heaven, forgiving me of my sins. But God, you know what? I'm not going to really be into this Christianity stuff as far as, you know, really embracing your purpose for me. Really becoming a disciple that makes disciples of others. I'm, I'm not going to really do that, God. Why, why would it be unwise to do that if you're truly born again of the Spirit of God? Well, first of all, you're a new creation in Christ. You know, when you receive the grace of God through Jesus Christ, it's not just that your sins are forgiven. In your spirit, life. <laughs> you're raised from death unto life. And at that moment, when you're born again of the Spirit of God, you become a new creation in Christ. You know what that means? That means the person that you used to be is dead, and you are a new person. And so, if you're just trying to live the old life after you come to Christ, because you're not willing to embrace His purpose for your life, you're actually being someone that you're not. I don't know. The most miserable people I know are people that are trying to be someone that they're not. And when you come to Christ, you're a new creation in him. Your old man is dead. That's why you get baptized in water. It's a picture that your old person is now dead and that you are alive in Christ. So you need to embrace God's purpose for your life because you're a new creation in Christ. Another reason you need to embrace God's purpose for your life is that you're the temple of God's Spirit. When you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, once again, 
Your, your sins are forgiven. You are under grace. You're in a position of favor. And you know what part of the favor is that he gives you? Immediately, he sends his spirit to dwell within your spirit, to be united with your spirit. And you know what that means? That means you're now a partaker of his divine nature. That means that in your heart of hearts, you now have a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. And in your heart of hearts, the spirit of the living God lives in you. You need to embrace God's purpose because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you know what God says? He says, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, you are under God's favor. And he is absolutely intent on changing you to glorify his son Jesus. And you know what he's going to do to accomplish that? Well, he's going to do what a loving parent does to their children when their children misbehave. He's going to discipline you. He's going to chasten you. Not because he's mad at you, but because he loves you. Third reason you need to change and accept God's purpose is that you are under grace. You know, <clears throat> grace is a remarkable thing. And I could give you all kinds of illustrations this morning in closing, but, <clears throat> you know, Grace is something that I see extended to people every day in this congregation. I mean, last night we celebrated Ben and Linda's 50th wedding anniversary. Isn't that great? 50 years. You know why they've made it to 50 years? Because they show each other so much grace. I mean, I know both of them. Well, I know them well. But they show each other so much grace in their marriage. And it's not one-sided. It's, it's a mutual thing in their life. Do you know why they do that? I mean, when, when Linda gets on Ben's nerves, do you know why he doesn't go out and get drunk? I'm glad you asked. Because he's experienced greater grace from someone else other than Linda. And the grace that he's experienced that's changed his heart is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'm telling you, the grace they show each other in their marriage is remarkable. But there is nothing as remarkable as the grace that God has shown us through Jesus Christ. And when you get that... When it finally clicks that you are the object of God's grace, it changes your heart, and you want to be that to other people. You mothers know all about grace. You're, you're, you're some of the greatest examples of grace that we have here today. I mean, come on. First of all, you made a decision to carry a child that you could have aborted. You could have. And what was that child doing for you, by the way, when you chose to carry it? What was that child doing for you? And then after you gave birth to that child, you nurtured that child. You cared for them. Well, tell me, what was that child doing for you? How was that child serving you? How was that child really helping you with all the things that you've got going on in your life? But you showed that child grace. And then as that child developed, you made decisions to help that child learn. You're going to teach them, you know, first of all, you know, teach them how to eat. <laughs> You're going to teach them how to use a spoon. You're going to teach them how to drink out of a cup. You're going you're gonna to teach that child how to crawl eventually. You're going to teach that child how to walk. And for what reason? What's that child doing for you? You see, you're showing that child grace, unmerited favor. And that is the image of God. But let me tell you this, that doesn't even compare to the grace that God has shown us through Jesus Christ. Because we were his enemies. We were at enmity with him. 
We were rebels against him. And he leaned forward and extended his favor to us and said, here you go. And you know what it's going to cost me? It's going to cost me my son, Jesus. And I'm going to do that because I love you. The remarkable grace of God. That's why all of us should yield ourselves to God's purpose and say, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. Because I have received your grace. Let's pray together this morning. Thank you, Father, for your great grace that you've extended to us through your son, Jesus.